Hello and welcome to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Tourism Tuesday, Winchester, Frederick County edition. Taking you on a tour. Justin Curtin has outdone himself. I think that was the first word out of my mouth when I got out of the car as I looked at you and went, what? What are you doing? It's fun. I'm keeping you on your toes. I am getting to know. and So you and I have had this conversation before about how I was born and raised here. And there are parts of this county and this city that I have never seen in my 50 plus years of living here. They have always existed. This place has existed in a different form that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But there are places that you have taken me to that have always been here that I didn't even know existed. And I'm a native. People are doing cool stuff. And I can't take any credit for it. All I do is just run around and brag about them. <laughs> let them be on the radio. They do all the work. I'm just literally saying, hey, these cool people are over here doing cool things. When you emailed me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, we're going to Laurel Grove Wine Farm, and you put wine farm in quotes, like, uh-oh. that was my first moment of pause. And then all week, so we're sitting here on a beautiful Friday afternoon. People were listening on Tuesday afternoon. All week this week, I have been telling people, I'm going to this wine farm on Friday. And they're like, I don't even know what that is. I would not have done it justice trying to describe it to them prior to my getting here. Me neither. That's why I'm glad that we came. We did some research on it, and then I was like, man, Renee, we need to go up here and check this out because it looks pretty fascinating. It just doesn't prepare you for what's here and the scope of what's going on. So that's why I thought it would be really good to do the radio segment to be able to lift that veil a little bit and kind of talk about the cool things that are going on here. I keep looking. Oh, it's just so At beautiful At the pond. Here. We're sitting it's in gorgeous. the barn. In Jacqueline Mommen is here. She is the proprietor, I guess is what the title is that we'll give her for Laurel Grove. Wine That's Farm. what I've given myself the title of, but I don't even know what to call myself. When people ask me what I do for a living, my son actually asked me, he was like, Mom, what's your job? And I was like, I don't know, babe. What do you think my job is? He's like, well, I guess you're a farmer. And I was like, farming, we'll go with farmer. viticulturist, environmentalist. I, I really just think um, I'm a project manager. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> On a vast scale. <laughs> I am totally kicking myself now, though, that when she gave us the tour in the Gator, that I didn't just pull out my phone and videotape and record right. everything that she was saying because I got the science education of a lifetime in our 20, 30 minute tour in the Gator of the entire property. Over 400 acres. Yeah, we're only developing for the vineyard 100 acres. The rest we're trying to leave as much in forest as possible. So, Part of the reason we chose 100 acres is because we have some financial constraints. <laughs> right. And if you're going to have land cleared for a vineyard, let's say you do a 20-acre vineyard, you have to pay someone to do that. And that is extremely expensive. So then someone told me that you can do clear cuts with loggers and they'll pay they'll you. They'll pay you. And I was like, amazing. So let's do that <laughs> instead. So I got in touch with the loggers and they were like, we only come out for 50 acres or more. And I was like, okay, Dustin, if we're going to have them come out, we have to think about the end scale of what we want to do right. because we can only and have then them come backwards. out once. So at maximum production, when we're fully functioning as a farm in 15 years, how much land do we want to have cleared? And I was like, let's just do 100 acres. We're never going to want to farm more than that. It gives us some wiggle room. They're coming once. They came in and they did 100 acres, and I really did not want them to knock over trees and disturb the root systems because that is part of that really important subsoil microbiome. But then I realized that we had to do something with all the stumps. So then <laughs> there's a learning curve here that is quite steep. And once we got all the trees down, then we had to get all the stumps dealt with. So we had all the stumps ground and then One we have time. been mulching. And as we mulch, we have been cover cropping and we have just spent two years in land preparation to get us to a point where we will plant our first vines next spring. They are on order. So let's back up for a second, though, yeah. because you did not grow up in this environment. Even as recent as the last five to ten years, you were a city girl. <laughs> yeah. How many um, generations? I am a fifth generation New Yorker. <laughs> Both my parents grew up in Queens, and my parents always worked in Manhattan. I have lived in Manhattan the last ten years. Before that, I lived there. I lived in Boston. My life was spent in New England and New York. 
the funny thing is, I always had a compulsion to be on a farm. Did you and go on a field trip in elementary school or yeah, something? What, what planet this? I don't know. I just, I always loved being in the mountains. I loved being outdoors. I went to hiking camps as a child. I always found myself gravitating in that direction. And I told my father when I graduated college that I wanted to start a cafe. I was 23 years old. I was like, I want to start a cafe in Massachusetts, close to where my grandmother has a house. It's an agricultural community. And my father, being the city guy that he is, and please take what he said with a grain of salt, that he was like, if you live in the country at 23, you're never going to get married, and I'm never going to have grandchildren. <laughs> and I was like... It said every parent everywhere. I was like... People who live in the country, dad, get married and have children. They actually have lots of children. They have more children, usually, <laughs> yeah. yes. I was a daddy's girl. I really listened to him a lot. So I went to school to get my MBA in restaurant management. I really followed the path of a foodie. I love quality food and great ingredients. And that was always a piece of my existence, coupled with wine. And that power that food has to bring people together and the power of meals and dining together. One of the things I really emphasize in my own family is we have dinner together every mm -hmm. night. We have meals together. Phones are not allowed. At Delicious table. meals and from what Justin and I have yeah, heard. Right. <laughs> it's true. I am a decent cook, but my mother-in-law, who is the spearheading chef of the store we are building, is an exceptional chef on another level. Better than some of the Michelin starred restaurants I've ever been to. She's another level. But I think that wine and good food and fresh ingredients has a real power to not just nourish our bodies, but nourish our souls. So many times when we hear chefs in particular talk about that sort of thing, that's what they're talking about, fresh ingredients. They're talking about organically grown. You're taking it, though, to the next level because as we're driving around looking at things, you're checking nematodes. You're looking yep. at humidity levels. So instead of organic, you use the word regenerative all the time. So yeah. for people listening, can you explain the difference between what's, if you say organic versus regenerative, what, yeah. what are you talking about? Organic exists on a scale. And I think regenerative is a throwback to what organic was when it first started. And I don't really know the history of organic and how the labeling diluted, part of it. Right. Yeah. But there was a moment in history where organic became synthetic inputs that were just made with organic ingredients. You go to the store and you get organic peanut butter. Some organic peanut butter actually it's not just peanuts ground with maybe some salt. It has organic palm oil and organic peanuts. And you're like, okay, I can understand that you are using organics there, but there's no reason why you need palm oil in, in peanut, peanut butter. butter. <laughs> Which has peanut oil. has its own oil. And I know it's a pain sometimes to mix peanut butter. Palm oil is actually not very good for our systems. Peanut butter is supposed to separate from its oil. <laughs> it wants to do that. It does. <laughs> and you just mix it. And if you want to actually avoid mixing it, when you first buy it, before you put it in the fridge, turn it upside down and it will mix itself. And then I did not know that. And, and then give it a little stir. It's already mostly mixed. Put it in the fridge. And once it's cold, it doesn't separate again. Yeah. I'm totally going home that? and putting my peanut butter in the fridge. I did oh not know gosh. that. Okay. I am learning so many things today. <laughs> so anyways, regenerative. Regenerative, uh, regenerative is just this philosophy that you can farm and create a system that improves soil health. And through our methodologies, our goal is to make the soil better, to make the plants healthier, to make the ecosystem healthier. And the healthier we can make the ecosystem, the better that system is at fighting off disease and mildew pressure and frost pressure on its own. And I'm not new. I've learned from so many people who have done this before. And the stories that you hear one after another are just remarkable. There is an apple farmer in Washington state. He transitioned his farm to regenerative over the course of three years. And they had a horrible frost. All of his neighbors lost all of their apple crops. And his farm, zero difference in location, he was able to maintain 90% wow. of his crop load just because the immune system of the plant is better stronger, able to shield it from plant. these environmental pressures. Wow. Yeah, but it's story after story like that. There was a regenerative farmer. He doesn't even think of himself as regenerative, but I found this guy on a list. I looked at regenerative... Uh, best regenerative vineyards in the United States. Right? <laughs> right, Google we, search. Yes. <laughs> and you have Opus One, you have Tablas Creek, California, California, California. 
and a guy in Pennsylvania, in the Poconos. So I was like, Dustin, we gotta go see this guy. Dustin's my husband. And- <laughs> Who's a saint, by the way. <laughs> he is a saint. So we go to see this guy in Pennsylvania, and I was like, I read this article about you. He was like, oh, so funny. They asked me to send in a soil sample, and it just turned out that I had like the healthiest soil. This guy wasn't trying to be regenerative. He just was taking didn't good want care to use chemicals. He didn't mow his lawn that much because he saw the benefit to pollinators and his vineyard had a wild feeling. It felt good to be there. And I was like, Dustin, this is how I want our system to look. It has flowers everywhere. There are animals. And he's like, yeah, I lose some grapes to other animals and some pests, but like spotted lanternfly whipped through the Poconos where he was. He's I never had a problem. What? Yeah. Mark Seven's gonna be happy to hear about that. <laughs> Spotted lanternflies actually can't digest plant enzymes when the sugar bricks of the plant and the leaves are at 14 bricks or more. Japanese beetles can't digest over 12 bricks. So if you can get your plants to photosynthesize at a rate where the sugars in the leaves and the trunks are 12 to 14 bricks or higher, they actually can't digest them. Then you've created a shield. And right. you're not doing this through any other means than everything that's as natural yeah. and organic, for lack of a better word, as right. possible. You're not spraying it. You're not genetically modifying anything. Nope. This is just nature at its finest. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, it took so much homework and so much learning to get to a point where I understood how to do that. And I don't even think I understand <laughs> one iota of what I could possibly understand. It is more difficult and it is more work and I understand that it's a different way of doing things than the way that we have done things for the last 60 years. But it is actually the way people did things before that. And most of the people who have done a lot of learning on regenerative ecosystems, they talk all the time about how they went to the library and they started reading farmer's almanacs and farmer diaries from the 1920s, 1910s. They looked at the tricks that the farmers would pick up from just paying attention. When I do this, my crops respond in this way. I eat fish for dinner, I take the bones and I plant them at the root structure of my plants in my garden. It's the same principle as fish hydrolysate, but you're using these natural systems. You take when you... My coffee grounds and my eggshells. We do the same thing. Exactly. Ah, see, science. I know science, Justin. Okay. Do you want to get in? Yeah, let's take break? a break. I know what you're about to talk yes. about the, I want to talk about the sheep and the, <laughs> I know you want to talk about the enzymes. The sheep I thought and that the was enzymes. Cool. Was cool. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the sheep and, and the, the enzymes. enzymes. Okay. But then I would like Jacqueline to tell everybody about her vision. I want to talk about Patty's place. I want to talk about all of the things that are going to come to fruition on this property. Let's do it. Is that cool? Let's do it. We are recording in advance on location at Laurel Grove Wine Farm. Jacqueline Mommen is here with us along with Justin Kearns from the Visitor Center. We're going to come back and talk more with both of them in just a couple of minutes. Hi, I'm Machiko, a senior at Mountain Vista Governor's School. Together with environmental nonprofit Sustainability Matters, we're rebranding recycling. Unfortunately, not all plastics are recyclable. Some localities only take plastic bottles. Others take all number one and number two plastics. Almost no one takes number four through seven. Plastic bags can't go in with irregular plastic recycling, but you can drop them off in other soft plastics and film drop-off spots at most supermarkets. For more on how we're rebranding recycling, Look for hashtag rebranding recycling on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, or visit sustainabilitymatters.earth. back to the valley today i am your host janet michael it is tourism tuesday winchester frederick county edition we are sitting at laurel grove wine farm justin kearns is here next to me jacqueline Mommen is here with us as well she is the grower we're gonna give her so many titles that yeah, she's we'll gonna have plenty of answers for her son the next time he says mom there what's your job <laughs> she'll have a ton of different things to be able to tell him farmer grower ceo executive marketer scientist uh, scientist all, all environmentalist true, and yet all feel somewhat inauthentic given that we we don't sell anything quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that's coming. That, that is, is coming. an important thing right. to note on the radio right now. Exactly. So before, <laughs> but yet, if you yet. come over here, there's nothing to buy yet. Before yeah. you can sell it, you have to grow, grow it. it. Yes. And in order to grow it, there are things that you have to put in place. When we went to break, Justin was so excited because he wanted to talk about the sheep and the enzymes. I thought yeah. that was cool. And that was the biggest question that I had been getting. I mentioned earlier how friends were saying, what's a wine farm? How is it any different than, say, a vineyard that maybe has goats for their patrons to be able to look at or play with. This is 
very, very, very different Integrated. because yeah. the sheep and the animals here play a vital role in the growing of the grapes. They do. We are trying to be extremely deliberate about how we lay out the vineyard. We have been monitoring microclimate here and using subsurface technology to see where the best planting areas are for vines because first and foremost, we are a vineyard. Then, based on that, we've been working with the Shenandoah Permaculture Institute to create layered ecosystems that are all meant to complement the vineyard system, like pawpaw patches and cider trees and silvopasture where sheep will have shade and pastured pigs to dig up the soil where we need them to and scratching birds to follow behind the sheep when they're in the vineyard in order to break up some of the dung patties and eat fly larvae. They all play a role in the ecosystem to make it more healthy. When you mentioned about the farmer's almanac and what farmers did in the 20s and 30s, they didn't have the equipment. No. They didn't have half of what we have today. What they had was your scratching birds and they had all of these yeah. things. That Stop was their around, only tools. Yeah. yeah, chicken manure going through is really high in nitrogen and sheep manure. So sheep in particular serve a very interesting role in vineyards. And if you look historically at Mediterranean systems for hundreds of years, sheep have always been in vineyards. It is because the saliva of the sheep, when they do the desuckering of the trunks, have a aliopathic effect on the vines. They create an immune response in them. In the beginning of the season, when they do this, the immune system of the vine becomes much stronger. It's almost like getting a, a vaccine. The reaction that the vines have to the sheep and their saliva and what is generally an attack on their system makes them stronger for the entire growing season. So sheep are really vital to that. But then we had to design a system that has sheep in it. So all of our <laughs> vines, our fruiting wire is gonna be at four and a half feet, which serves a few purposes. One is that the sheep can be able to graze in and out of each of the vine systems and not get stuck. It also gets us off the canopy floor, which relieves a lot of humidity pressure. Our vines are gonna be planted to maximize wind direction in order to make sure that that wind that is They're constantly slow. blowing yeah. through our vineyard is drying off those leaves after a rain event, even though that hasn't happened this year. <laughs> right. We don't have rain events anymore. <laughs> right. We're hoping that we have more rain events in the future where these will come into play. So when we think about it as a wine farm, it's because we are not just producing vines. It is a fully functioning farm it's a system. It is a system. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned we're working with the Shenandoah Permaculture Institute in order to design these systems, and they really have an expertise on harvesting times and what clones to use and what's native. And we've been working with the Clifton Institute and the, the, Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Institute to develop a... Oh, the native, Conservation Research the, Center. Yeah. So we've been working with them and NRCS to come up with a perennial wildflower grass system that is going to be the basis of the vineyard floor that is adequate for grazing and pollinators. We're really trying to make that system. And we were like, okay, we have sheep. What are we going to do with them? And I was like, you like lamb. And Dustin was like, I do like lamb. And his mother is an is, excellent chef at preparing it. She is. So we were like, okay, we're going to sell all this stuff. So in another parallel universe story to ours, we saw on Google Earth Pro that there was a roof in the woods on a corner of our property, and I got in touch with the previous owner, Gary Williams, who has become a member of our family. And I was like, there's this roof in the woods. What is that? <laughs> is that ours? <laughs> and he was like, actually, it is. It was the old Mount Williams schoolhouse. So I got on my excavator for the first time, and we cleared out a path to this schoolhouse, and as soon as I walked inside, I knew it had to be something. This is gonna be a store. As the farm vision has evolved, the store and how it's come about and what its purpose is has also come into clarity. The store, which we came up with the name Patty's Place as a tribute to Gary and his late wife, Patty, who lived on the farm for Generations. Ever. Generations. Gary's father lived here and then Gary and Patty moved in and then Patty got very sick and passed away here. 
her, her legacy is very strong mm-hmm. and we really thought that it was a tribute to Gary and his love of this place and his late wife so Patty's is going to be a very confusing <laughs> but really cool store where we will sell lamb and eggs and chicken and prepared foods by Oma and coffee because we love great coffee (laughs) and we're not finding a lot of great coffee close by the Mount Williams area so (laughs) we should sell it you are you are a tad out here we are a tad out here (laughs) but in addition to selling all those farm market options that you would think of we also are a vineyard right while We don't have our own wine in production yet. There are lots of vineyards who are making regenerative wine and organic wine, certified or not, but farming in that way. And we really want to showcase the work that they're doing. So we're going to have a small wine cellar where we sell those things. And one of the things I'm most excited about is we are going to have a classroom space where we teach, I guess, what is commonly called homesteading skills, but they were just like life skills that we have lost. So quilting, canning, You'll be able to bring other vineyard owners in, other farmers. Because Justin and I have talked to a lot of Mm -hmm. what we've deemed micro farms. Yeah, these micro farms. But these kids, compared to my age, these kids, that don't really know even where to start. They just know it's something they want to do. You're going to be a huge resource for them and offer them this education in this space. Sure. And there is a lot of other local knowledge here and other people who can share what they have learned. And this is a space that they can use to share what they've learned. So there's one component of learning that are these kind of life skills that we are losing. But in addition to that, we really want this farm to be an example. We're happy to make the mistakes for other people to kind of transition to this style of farming. The more I dug into the rabbit hole of environmental degradation and climate change, yes, climate change it happens naturally, but we are also contributors. We waste a lot. We throw away a lot of plastic. We have an impact on our surroundings. And farming is one of the biggest problems more so than cars more so than Mm -hmm. planes and people don't realize it the way that we are farming is killing soil biology at an exponential rate and that soil biology captures carbon it retains water there used to be historical droughts all the time but because soil was covered and had healthy biology farmers could go a month without rain and it wouldn't bother their ecosystems at all And because we've walked away from that, our systems are much more vulnerable. So I really want to have a place where farmers can get together and share experiences, successes and failures, have other regenerative farmers who are much more experienced than I am come in and teach me and other farmers who are interested. We have a gentleman, Jeremiah Markway, who I went to his sheep school to learn anything about sheep. (laughs) And he's coming and he's a regenerative rancher who specializes in intensive rotational grazing with the sole purpose of improving soil health. He is going to come in and do our first workshop in March. Patty's Place open March 2024. So that's what I was going to ask you. So walk me through in a perfect world. Everything goes according to plan. (laughs) So we know it's not going to actually happen that way. What kind of timeline are you looking at for what to happen when? Yeah. First things first is Patty's Place will open. It's at the intersection of Wardensville Grade and Laurel Grove Road. We have been planning this thing for about two years, but construction begins Monday. We've been working with LCW and they project that they will be finished mid-March. We're going to do a soft opening March, April, where we are just doing prepared foods, coffee, wine. It's when wine. Justin and I get to come. Yep. That's uh, what we yeah, but we'll be open to the public and we'll be working out the kinks for those first few months and also while our produce gardens start producing. So the produce gardens will start to be developed this late winter, early spring. Once those start producing, we will have that product in the market as well and workshops will be happening throughout. So we're hoping we are really churning by summer and fall. And then that will be open year round forever. To grow grow and expand and 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 do, yeah. And in the meantime, our first vines get planted next spring. We are planting successive, we're starting with five acres. We'll plant five acres every year. We're looking to be at maximum capacity of 35 to 40 acres, which is about three to 5,000 cases. We want to specialize in Rhone blends. 
we love to drink wines from the Rhone. So we thought while climate change is happening, we might as well <laughs> capitalize on that and build right. hot weather climate grapes because our climate seems to be reflecting that they can. So we're planting Cab Franc, uh, Tanat, Cabernet Sauvignon, and our favorite grape, Syrah. Syrah is really what we want to be at the basis of everything. And then once we have our red program going, we will have a white program. We only aim to produce three wines, a heavier bodied red, a lighter bodied red, and a white blend. The tasting room will be on the other side of the farm. We'll have a separate entrance. The tasting room looks to be open eight years if things go great, 10 years if things go okay, <laughs> and we'll see how that and goes. And that's the other piece of this. I mean, you're going to be putting these vines, you're gonna start these vines next spring. Yeah. And it takes how many years for them produce. even to produce? And yep. then you make the wine that then also has to age. age. Yep. So this is not a process where you can, for example, and we were joking about this earlier inside joke, plant cucumbers. And the <laughs> next thing you know, you've got cucumbers in six to eight weeks. This is not that. No, <laughs> this is clearly a long-term life goal. We were not looking to have new jobs. We were looking to have a new life. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old and we want them to be in this life. I hope that they learn to love it and I hope they take it over. And <laughs> I hope we become one of those farms that is multi-generational. Mm -hmm. That would be my really, really long-term vision. But my son's already talking about how he wants to have a flower farm. And I was Perfect. like, we can do that. We yes. can do that here. We have that here. Yeah, we have that's right. That's right. Yeah, whatever, whatever you want. 400 are. acres, man. Yeah. Let's do it. And Justin, we were joking earlier, too, when we were riding around the farm about you and Renee just trying to wrap your heads around all of the options and the opportunities and the things that are available here you for tourists. You haven't seen the map. It she is, didn't show you the map. The map, yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around the map. It is, um, it is crazy, it's but lot. it's great. I love the way that she's doing Patty's Place because that will become the, the foundation. Start, right. And people will get familiar with it. You'll be able to educate them and tell them what's coming. And then a whole nother group of wine tourists are gonna be able to come right. when the tasting room is open and the winery is fully up and running. This checks so many tourism boxes. And we think, you know, eight years, gosh, that's so far away. But it's not. I've been here eight years and it feels like I just got here it, a year yeah, or two ago. Not. So I'm gonna blink and we're gonna be there. It's um, not that far off. Yeah. Uh, so I just had my 40th birthday two years ago. Such and, a child. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had mine five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> this was already long in the works at that party. And my friends were like, so when do you think you're going to be ready with the vineyard? And I was like, guys, the goal is to have my 50th birthday party in, in the, the tasting room. room. <laughs> so that's what I set as my benchmark. That's what you're working for, right? Right now, we're actually, if you can believe it, we're, we're Don't working say it. on schedule. Don't say it. <laughs> Don't say it out loud. All the wood. Do not right. say it out loud. And <laughs> the amount of, so we moved down here from New York, New York City, and I have been commuting once a week from New York City to Winchester. I am so glad to finally be here full time mm -hmm. and just have this be my every day. I'll so never again been... complain about the drive to right. anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband still commutes though, right? My husband does commute. So yeah. he drives to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, takes the Amtrak to New York. He does it once a week and then he comes back later in the week. Wow. I know. One of the benefits of having it be such a long-term project is, again, financial constraints. If we were going to do it faster, we probably couldn't afford it. And some of these things that you're talking about doing can't happen any faster. It's you, true. Things Literally, have yeah. to happen the way they happen in their time. You can't yep. force them. We took a forest system right. and are trying to transition it to a cropping system, and that takes a few years. Off the soil, <laughs> Especially the if you have to grind that, all yeah. those stumps. stumps. <laughs> exactly. 168 <laughs> of them a day. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So where can people go to follow along in your journey? Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Yep. I have been taking more online classes than I know what to do with <laughs> for the last five years. And one of my professors early on was like, you should be journaling. This is a very unusual story. You should be podcasting. Should be... We're, we'll talk about that when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, like one thing at a time. So I was like, okay, but if I journal, how am I gonna translate that into something that's marketable in the future? So my cousin, who is 23 at the time, she was like, just put it on Instagram. And I was like, 
Could okay. you create me an Instagram account? Which was a moment I felt quite old. And so she set me up with an Instagram oh my account. God, she's 40 and she feels old because of Instagram. <laughs> I'm like really, feeling 125 sitting here right now. I really was like, I don't want to be on my phone all the time. I really tried to push away from that. But I have changed my thought process on it. Granted, you have to control yourself because I could see how it takes over. Mm -hmm. But I started journaling two years ago on Instagram about the journey of Laurel Grove Wine Farm. So if you go to at Laurel Grove Wine Farm, you can follow our journey. And I make sure to make sure it's very honest. I post all of our bad experiences as well as our good experiences. Like the sheep that we just got, they escaped <laughs> on the, day two. In the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. <laughs> and we somehow magically got them back, yeah. which we weren't even excited about. Because we apparently like, all you have to do is put a rope around their necks. Apparently. And <laughs> lead them. Cursing at them in the dark doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work, work to get them back in the paddock. <laughs> the just class to, one, sheep 101. Cursing, cursing at sheep in the dark no. does not cursing work. Cursing <laughs> doesn't help you. And then we have a website, www.laurelgrovewinefarm.com. It's very basic at the moment, but you can see the different components of what we're building. But I have found that on Instagram, not only have I been able to share my story, but I have been able to connect with people in this mm -hmm. community and communities around the world. And all of my poo-pooing on Instagram, <laughs> joke is on me. What a wonderful, <laughs> powerful tool of connection. Yeah. And you just You're have to using it yourself. for good. You're right. not using yeah. it for what yeah. more and often again, than not people do. you just have to control do. yourself. And you go on, you post your thing, you communicate with your people, and then you have to shut it down and put it away right. and be done with it. Ah, <laughs> you're funny now. Now yeah. you're just being funny. <laughs> Three hours later, and I'm like, when did it get dark outside? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so... People can't really come up. There's not really much to do yet because you're not really open to the public yet. But the way that I'm telling people where you are is everybody knows where Marker Miller is. So from Marker Miller, it took me like eight minutes to get up to what's going to be the wine entrance. And it's another couple minutes to get up around. Yep. So it's about 12 minutes to Patty's place from yep. so Marker Miller. So if you're Miller, going down far. Cedar Creek Grade and you turn on Laurel Grove Road, the way to get to the vineyard is just west on Laurel Grove Road, about six miles from Cedar Creek Grade. To Patty's place, it's actually easier if you go 50 and then right. make the left on to Wardensville Grade because from one end of the farm to the other, because of the way that corner is, it actually adds an additional seven minutes. Right. And follow along cool. because then they'll know when March right. comes along right. and can come visit. Well, one of the things that we are trying to do is we have been talking to Dana Garrity and we have been talking to the Foxes who have their micro Love John Fox. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah. And the Garrities. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just, again, lovely community. And we haven't floated the idea with them yet. But one of the things we'd like to do is at markets like that, where we feel that there's a lot of parallel interest, we're going to try and sell one of our staple products, which is bone broth. We make a bone broth. It takes us about three days to make. We source mm -hmm. our bones from... Back to Basics, which is another local homestead. If you learn about the health effects of bone broth, slow cooked bones and the broth that it makes, makes it so the nutrients in bones are more readily digestible in your intestinal tract. So they're more easily absorbed, which increases your immune health. Ah. It actually helps you sleep better. The collagen in the bones improves your skin elasticity. They have an anti-inflammatory, and we add turmeric to even extend the range of that anti-inflammatory benefit. We really think that, especially at this moment, if we can go to other people and explain to them nutritious food, food that has not been... Okay, so I'm going to geek out for two seconds. But one of the problems with food that has a lot of antibiotic on it, right? So if you think of a pesticide or an herbicide or a fungicide, they are antibiotics in some in, form of another. When you eat that, you then put antibiotics in your gut and you end up destroying your own bacteria, your own microbiome in your gut, and therefore your immune system can't function. Most Americans have something called leaky gut, which is when their bacteria is not healthy anymore and the immune system exists outside your intestinal tract. They can't actually communicate with each other and they can't function, which is why we have more new diseases now than we ever had. 90% of the food in the grocery store didn't exist before 90 years ago. Crazy to think about. It's crazy to think about. But if you walk around the grocery store, 
It's striking. There were no Fruit Loops 90 years ago, Justin. There were none. <laughs> I, this is way off topic, but my mom was clearing out old boxes from when my grandmother passed away 20 years ago. And she had this cookbook. It was the American Women's something or other cookbook from like 1905. This was beat up things, been used for years oh, yeah. and years. But I started going through it and you just look at the recipes and you look at the ingredients that they call for in the recipes and oh, you get hog's brain. I'm like, uh, what? Okay. <laughs> and like, they tell you there's like a thing in there that tells you how to cook squirrel. And I'm yep. like, mm -hmm. this is not in the Betty Crocker cookbook that you go down to the store and get it. <laughs> this is not, but the ingredients in there, you're right. The, yeah. What you're saying, the ingredients, like you would not find some of those ingredients in the store just yeah. raw the way that they are, the way they used to be. And so you can buy bone broth in the store, but the problem is they've actually created synthetic chemicals to mimic the taste of bone broth and that is actually what's in it and you actually find yourself eating things like carcinogens that you think you're doing something really good and what you end up doing is harmful unbeknownst to you because they even will put on bone broth that is made from synthetic the health benefits of them so it is more work for the consumer to find the things that are healthy and my kids hate going to the grocery store with me because <laughs> i am i read all the ingredients yeah. and they're like mommy can we have these xyz uh -huh. okay so gonna... i don't for me like i am the world's worst eater if it does if it's not coated in sugar i'm not eating it but my dogs eat healthier than any human being, even my kid. When Josh was growing up, he loves vegetables. He will choose carrots over a candy bar now. Yeah. Uh, not me. I don't know that I've eaten a carrot, even though it's orange. I don't know that I've eaten a carrot in 15 years. <laughs> but my dogs, I'm looking at those ingredients. We, we all really should be better stewards of our own bodies sure. and our own health and our own food intake. One of the other things about bone broth that we really like is that you get meat and it comes with bones and people just throw them away. The bones. But... The bones are actually not only where all the flavor is and all the taste is. We want people to try and use more, keep more. Like the paddock that's on this farm, you come here and it looks a little dilapidated and it was pretty weathered when we got here. And yes, we could have just knocked it down and started from scratch, but that is not espousing our values. We found gates that are in the woods. They're really rusted, but they still function. So we put those up. We didn't have to use new inputs. I kid you not, I think that every single checkout person at Martin's thinks that I'm insane because I must be the only person that brings my own grocery bags every time. We bring them too, and yeah, it's pretty unusual. I keep saying I'm They're gonna like, do that and I I'm haven't. Like, I really don't bag them, I have my own bags. I used to have plastic bags that I would bring home and then I just ended up with hundreds of plastic bags and I was like, what do I do with these now? And now I have no plastic bags. It's great. There's a place behind. We'll not take ours to get because they're free trash bags and we use them in the bathroom. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I'll Everyone's do I'll do that for again. some of them. But there's a place behind where the restore used to be. I know that it's moved mm -hmm. recently over right. to Millwood Avenue, but where restore used to be behind where my husband works at Dotson Pest Control okay. Trex. There yeah. is a giant dumpster-like thing back there that you can put all of your plastic bags in that Trex collects and turns into the whatever. Trex. But right. it all goes to NW Works. It's a fundraiser for NW Works, oh. so you can throw all of those plastic bags that then get recycled into really? the product Trex makes, and it somehow benefits NW Works. I can't remember the logistics, but Carly was on the show last year and told me all about it. That's super, super cool. cool. I did not so even know go. about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's Great. your little. I other need to listen to your show more often. <laughs> you really do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> other than being on it. I know. <laughs> uh, we have to wrap up today. Yes, we do. Desperately, so we yes. have in this last what people are listening to on the radio. That's 12, maybe 14 <laughs> minutes long. We're at 29. Yeah, you. So got a you. Lot. Use this opportunity to remind people that everything doesn't always make it to the radio show, but everything always makes it to the podcast. So if you're listening along and you want to know, what did they talk about? Did I miss some super secret thing about bone broth? Do I need to know more about peanut butter? <laughs> All and of enzymes. that. And sheep, right. sheep enzymes. <laughs> All of that is on the podcast that you can find at the Valley Today Podcast.com. Right. But Jacqueline, thank you. This has been thank a you. fantastic afternoon. Thank you. I have had so much fun. What a morning, what a blast. And we really want to espouse community. We want to promote health. We want to get people in touch with their food again. And we just hope that people come with an open mind and an open heart. We don't poo poo existing in society. We yeah. also exist in society. We go out to restaurants and we eat things and we're not like, is everything at your restaurant organic or I'm not eating here? We, it's we not are all people. or nothing. It's not all or nothing. And it's not as complicated as people think it is. It is not. And it's just 
little baby steps in sorry that direction will like make that. us. Sorry, sorry, it was very yes. much like that. Yes. And it's funny that you say that we were talking about Sari Carp yeah. earlier, and I was thinking that I was going to add on to the end of the show. Is this show is somewhat in her memory because so much of what Jacqueline was telling us during the tour kept reminding me of her and her goals and her missions with sustainability matters. So and she wouldn't, glad she that you wouldn't force that it on you to make a hundred percent change in your life right now. She would say, try one thing a week. Eat one thing less per week. Replace it with something once per week. And she wouldn't make you feel miserable and unworthy if you weren't doing yes. it. See, you know, Siri, like we, were yes. <laughs> my, we were listening. My mom is in town and she was like, oh, at the grocery store, when you go, pick me up some Diet Coke. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Do you know what's in that, mom? I know. <laughs> right. I was like, uh, yep. So again, we're not trying to be dogmatic. We just are providing an alternative for people. And hopefully when you come and you're at Patty's, maybe you'll look at some of our cookbooks and lots of the cookbooks that we have on our shelves talk about how those ingredients really promote health and wellness in your body. And maybe you'll wanna to come to a workshop with my sister who's an integrative wellness physician and does this exact same thing, except instead of soil with gut microbiome. <laughs> we you laugh know. about it all the time. Well, you guys so, are a team. Wow. Right? I know, yeah. I know. We really look forward to seeing you all. Well, awesome. welcome to the community. Thank, Thank you, you for coming here. And we're excited to see what you got in the future. So now I'm a little concerned about what September might You know what? I almost missed this place because I think everybody probably listening to the show, and I hope this gets into the final cut. I'm saying, have you guys heard about that the wine farm that's coming? It's out in Western Frederick. No, nobody has any idea. I'm like, okay, I know you guys all read the star. I know you all read the paper. Like it was front page a month ago. There was a big article about trees. They planted this huge thing about these people trying to break this record. This guy trying to break a record with planting all these trees. It was front page of the paper. Oh, we saw that article. That was the winery. <laughs> it was. We... If you actually read the article onto the second page, yeah. that tree planting was at the winery as part of the regenerative. And ah. yeah. Everybody missed that. So I've told people, it was in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> it was like front page in the paper. Yeah. That's a whole nother story. That's but a everybody... whole yeah, this, Again, this is why she needs a podcast. That's why she needs a podcast. There we go. We got her on the radio. It's a start. Yes, that's All perfect. Right. And thank you. As much thank as you. I give you grief, there this hasn't been fine. a show yet it's that fine. we've done that I've left going, I am never doing that again. <laughs> So far, you're back in the house, and I do. I keep coming back for more. <laughs> <laughs> I will be back tomorrow. It is, as always, a brand new episode of The Valley today, a few minutes afternoon, so meet me here for it. 